What are some hooks that people can have? Not like specific features, but is it like anything else? Is it kind of like Elm? Is it kind of like ClojureScript? And we've already contrasted it from TypeScript. It's not a superset of JavaScript. It's not JavaScript. But would you say there's like, it's Elm-esque in terms of it's a language kind of uh, FP style? Yeah, yeah. So no, it's actually not. It looks a lot like JavaScript, acts a lot like JavaScript, and uh, in our opinion, compiles to the highest quality of clean, readable, and performant JavaScript, which is okay. really nice. Big thanks to our partners, Linode, Fastly, and LaunchDarkly. We love Linode. They keep it fast and simple. Check them out at linode.com slash changelog. Our bandwidth is provided by Fastly. Learn more at fastly.com. And get your feature flags powered by LaunchDarkly. Get a demo at launchdarkly.com. This episode is brought to you by our friends at O'Reilly. Many of you know O'Reilly for their animal tech books and their conferences, but you may not know they have an online learning platform as well. The platform has all their books, all their videos, and all their conference talks. Plus, you can learn by doing with live online training courses and virtual conferences, certification practice exams, and interactive sandboxes and scenarios to practice coding alongside what you're learning. They cover a ton of technology topics, machine learning, AI, programming languages, DevOps, data science, cloud, containers, security, and even soft skills like business management and presentation skills. You name it, it is all in there. If you need to keep your team or yourself up to speed on their tech skills, then check out O'Reilly's online learning platform. Learn more and keep your team skills sharp at O'Reilly.com slash changelog. Again, O'Reilly.com slash changelog. This is JS Party, your weekly celebration of JavaScript and the web. If you haven't joined the JS Party community yet, what are you waiting for? It's a fun and welcoming place where you can discuss web dev, ask questions, get notified of live shows, and help make the podcast even more awesome. Just head to jsparty.fm slash community and sign up today. Okay, let's get into it. Hey, it's party time, y'all. there in javascript land it's your internet friend jared and i'm here for a fun show about rescript today frost is joining us what's up frost how's it going jared it's going good hey you launched a new thing it's called wormhole how's that going good yeah going pretty good it's fun times tell the folks what it is real quick yeah it's a tool for sending files to people with end-to-end -end encryption so you can safely send your files across the interwebs yes it's like uh, Firefox Send, only they shut that down, and this is probably even cooler because you built it. Maybe you'll have to give us the skinny sometime. Like the, we already did the nitty gritty on BitMidi. We might need to yeah. <laughs> regroup and get one for a wormhole. Yeah, let's do it. Awesome. Sounds like a plan. We're also joined by Patrick Ecker, who is with the Rescript Association. We're here to talk about Rescript. You may have heard of Rescript. Maybe not. Maybe you heard of BuckleScript. Maybe not. Maybe you heard of Reason. Maybe not. Maybe you heard of OCaml. Maybe you've heard of none of these things. We're going to sort through all that and hopefully dive deep into this cool language and ecosystem for building web apps and maybe even more. Who knows? Patrick, welcome to JS Party. Thank you for having me. We're excited. I thought we would start with all of that because I had never heard of Rescript, but I had heard of Reason and I hadn't heard of BuckleScript until I read the rebranding post, but y'all have been around for a while in different forms and there's like multiple tools that have come together to kind of unify and hopefully have a cohesive story going forward. But give us the background, these disparate tools or involved tools, and then kind of the coming together, maybe sort through that from the start, and then we'll get into the nitty gritty from there. Sure. Yeah, this is probably the, the most famous question whenever is someone asking about Rescript, because a lot of people uh, got in touch with ReasonML and BuckleScript which is like a cohesive tool chain, like Reason is the syntax and BuckleScript is the compiler, which takes Reason syntax and then, which looks also a lot like JavaScript and paths to JavaScript. And this has been going on for a few years and they also made some like cross compilation story out of it. And then people got involved with a lot of OCaml, which this whole thing is built on basically. And there was like two communities going on. There was one community going more into this native exploration direction. They wanted to compile to native. They wanted to have a nice garbage collected language that is almost as fast as Rust. 
And then we had like the JavaScript story, which should be like a single tool chain. It should be simple to understand. It should be easy to integrate in existing JavaScript code bases. And this was also like the bigger uh, setting point of the platform because uh, a lot of people got into this JavaScript compilation thing and they used it actually in their projects for more than two years, three years in production now. And the major problem here was that people got confused. So they got into the community and they were like, okay, I want to do ReasonML. What can I do? And then they're like, oh, do you want to do native or do you want to do JavaScript? And I was like, okay, what do I do? What is like the, the easiest? And it's like, oh, you can do this and that with this compiler or with this compiler, or you can do the OCaml array with something else, which was always confusing. And we, we never liked the idea of decoupling like the syntax from the compiler. And uh, in 2020, after one year of development of an like like a rewrite of the syntax, we decided to align the compiler with the with the syntax, with this new syntax, which is actually even more JavaScripty as ReasonML, and called it Rescript. And we also made it really, really clear that this is all about JavaScript development. So we built a tool chain which kind of feels sim similar from a workflow perspective. So you basically install uh, like similar, like other compiled to JS languages like TypeScript or Elm or whatever, you install one NPM package, NPM install, Rescript, and you've got all the tools you need to compile Rescript files to equivalent JavaScript files. And ever since we did that, suddenly people get it. People get to the platform, they get to one cohesive website, all the resources are on there. We have a cohesive story for React development. We have cohesive stories for how to integrate it with Next, how to integrate it with like any React application that already exists. And we made it really clear. We also removed all the, the, the wording for ReasonML or OCaml because it's not relevant anymore. We care about like minimalistic design, um, minimalistic CLI, no configuration or low configuration actually, and also a formatter, like a syntax formatter without any options, like without any of them, not even like the width, not even semicolons, nothing. There is just one style basically enforced and uh, we are really, really glad we did that. Like we are really happy that this is now such, now it's easy to understand and now we are happy and now we want to start out again with a fresh brand and a cohesive story. I just have to say, the more you kept talking, the more excited I was getting. All the words you were using, minimalist, no configuration, a formatter without any options, no semicolons, like focusing the, the website down. I'm really curious now to try it. <laughs> right, right, right. It's it's so exciting also for me because I'm also not the, the biggest fan of like this bulky, huge languages that give you like 15 different configurations and every project looks different. And the second thing is like the major selling point of the platform is that it's fast, like ridiculously fast. It's, it's hard to describe, actually. We, we try to um, build a platform that doesn't rely on caching. So we can compile, I don't know, 3000 files in a project once and then uh, can start a cold build, or actually we do a build, we cache files on the file system level, but we don't need an extensive incremental um, background service, which requires like two gigabytes of RAM, like in TypeScript. Uh, if you want to have a fast build, you need to wind up this huge server and then it indexes all your files and then caches get invalid in, in between in memory. And then you switch branches and then suddenly all your type information is kind of corrupted. And then you need to do a cold build again, and this takes 20 minutes. Like if you have a big code base, like a serious code base, for smaller projects, it's probably not a problem. But Rescript really scales with like the amount of files you have. Like if you start out with a 10 files project, it's, I mean, it's instant. It's 20 to 50 milliseconds per build. doesn't matter if it's like an incremental build or a cold build. And then you have huge size projects. Like uh, I have one client who has like 3,290 files or something. Like the, the first initial build, if you like completely clean this whole thing and build it uh, once, it takes like one minute and, and 30 seconds. And this is not even optimized. There are like a few things you can tweak to, to make the compilation faster. But after that, like every, you change a file and uh, it doesn't take like forever to just recompile this one file. And it doesn't really rely on these caches I was talking about. And then things get way less complex if you can just rely on one simple uh, command that winds up when you need it and then winds down when it's done. 
Oh yeah, I mean, so zooming out a little bit, like it sounds like you got really good performance on builds, and as far as a compiled language goes, you have a lot of nice features. But like, why would I use Rescript over just plain JavaScript? Because plain JavaScript files have no build time. So why would I, you know, what am I getting by using Rescript uh, over over plain JS or or something like TypeScript? Yeah, so plain JS is a dynamic untyped language. So. For me personally, when I write a bigger JavaScript application, it's usually very hard to maintain it or refactor it, especially if it's like a really complex code base with a lot of people working on the same code base. Uh, if it's like a React application or an Angular application, doesn't matter. TypeScript tries to mitigate that by adding, like being a superset of JavaScript. So you can turn around a JavaScript file into a TypeScript file and it will still compile, but then you can also add type annotations and stuff. So it is a gradual type system. And these ones have the downside that they need to deal with the complexities of JavaScript because JavaScript is a very dynamic language. It is very polymorphic. You can do a lot of things you usually cannot do in like statically compiled sound languages. And what Rescript is, it's a sound type language. That means that every value in your program needs to have a type, like has a type annotated. There is no any type, there is no mixed type or no unknown type or, or some sorts of that, which makes it very robust. We also don't have, like in the language, in the core language, if you just write Rescript code, you don't have any null pointer exceptions because we don't have any null. We don't have the concepts of null. And instead have a few other niceties which help you build very complex applications. For instance, we've got variant types, which are also very well known in languages like Rust, which is a data data structure to uh, design complex domains. You can, it's kind of, if you think about like TypeScript, when you're uh, using a tagged union, you usually have like an object type and then you have an attribute type on there and you call it type user. And then uh, you have some certain attributes available because this is like a user type. And which is kind of like abusing the object type of some sense and then gradually like refining the type. In Rescript, we have the variants, which look a little bit like, I don't know how to explain it. You would define uh, a type user and then you have uh, constructors, values called that, I don't know, admin or user or privileged user or moderator. And then you can attach data to it. So you can say, you can have like an admin constructor and this one contains like a string for the username. And then you can just use that as a, like as a value in your program. And then you can pattern match on that with, uh, with a very powerful switch like state, uh, like expression. So you, uh, you can really like design your domain just with types and then later on use these values to manage your application code. And uh, the sound type thing is also very nice because like refactoring is a, a totally different story there. Whenever you're doing uh, TypeScript, you're uh, installing some libraries. These libraries maybe involve some definition files. These definition files may come from a third party that is uh, maintained independently from any other, like from the from the actual library. Maybe it's like a, an add-on, which is maybe the, the library is not written in TypeScript and they write a definition file for that. So information can be stale or wrong or uh, some sorts. And it's not always clear when you refactor a code base or when you raise a dependency or when you do this kind of stuff, if your code really works. And as soon as you have like this one trust issue in your type system, the type system suddenly isn't that nice anymore. I mean, you have autocompletion, yeah, and, and some other nice tooling uh, opportunities. But uh, the full trust where you say, okay, when the, when the program compiles, it will like work unless I'm doing like, you know, uh, bailout functionality for communicating with external JavaScript. Yeah, that's, that's really great if you can do that. If you can say with, with a convincing voice, okay, yeah, this program compiles, I'm pretty sure this will just work. So no bugs. That's, that's what I want. I want no bugs. I mean, you, you, will, still, you will still have bugs, right? But right, I'm um, <laughs> it's, it's, it's very easy to at least say, if I change the interface of something, yeah. the compiler will really help me. Like the, the compiler error messages are really good, especially with this variant types I was talking about. Uh, when you change something and then the compiler will say, okay, this interface doesn't uh, match here and there. If you do pattern matching and you're, for instance, adding new cases to a variant, for instance, I have my admin and my moderator and I want to add a user variant constructor or whatever, then pattern matchers 
wherever I have a switch expression, uh, the compiler will tell me, hey, you forgot to add the user uh, constructor case. And when yeah. I remove the user constructor and it says, there is no user constructor. So this is super useful when, for instance, uh, you're building React components. And you know, like React components in the beginning are super easy. You're like, oh, I need to have a button. Okay, um, HTML button, that's it. And then it's like, oh, but we need accessibility, right? And then you need like, okay, I need to uh, annotate different states when there's an hover state or when there is like a, a click hover or when you're like a touch, um, when you have touch and, and other interactions. Suddenly the code gets really, really complex. And when you look at things like um, Tailwind did a really, really great uh, like library for uh, doing the heavy lifting for you where you um, get React components and then you just use them and they implement the complex logic um, in the background. Maybe check that out. Check out how complex this code can get with TypeScript. Uh, yeah. Just because they're using these tagged union objects and then they try to, to shoehorn it in with some switch statements and then it's, it's, it's really hard to read and then you need to annotate everything because this, uh, the type system uh, needs more help inferring all your types. In Rescript, every type that is inferred from the compiler is 100% correct. And this is also very, very nice uh, if you can trust the compiler there to do the right thing. Mm -hmm. Well, pattern matching is really cool. So that's a great language feature that I always appreciate. It's difficult sometimes, I think, when we are you know, hearing about something brand new, like un unfamiliar, to like, get a frame of reference. You know, Rescript is a lang it's, its own language, right? It's a language that compiles to JavaScript. And so what are some hooks that people can have not like specific features, but like, is it like anything else? Like, is it kind of like Elm? Is it kind of like closure script? And we've already contrasted it from TypeScript. It's not a superset of JavaScript. It's not JavaScript, but would you say there's like, it's Elm-esque in terms of it's a language kind of uh, FP style? Yeah. Yeah. So no, it's actually not. It looks a lot like JavaScript, acts a lot like JavaScript, and uh, in our opinion, compiles to the highest quality of clean, readable, and performant JavaScript, which is okay. really nice. It's our marketing pitch. So our idea was, which is kind of rare, we haven't seen this before, that's why we build it. You really write your code, like you have your typical let bindings or let variable kind of thing. We call it let bindings. So you define a variable or you define a function with arrow function syntax. We only have one syntax for functions, which is the arrow syntax, which compiles to an actual named function. So you don't have to worry, should I use a named function or should I use a named function without a name? Should I use a arrow function? Should I use a, you know, or should I use bind or whatever? We don't have that concept. We just use the arrow function syntax for that. We don't have classes, which means that we replicate the behavior of classes by saying that we just think about values and functions, and then we have a pipe operator to chain all these things together. So we can model an object-oriented system just with values and the pipe operator, which looks a little bit like PHP because our pipe operator is basically like an arrow, so a dash uh, angle bracket. Mm -hmm. And uh, which means, oh, I cannot interact with um, object-oriented systems like with classes in, in existing JavaScript code, right? But we can, because we also added to this, we added an external syntax, it is called, which is finding, you can define an external that binds to an existing JavaScript function. And you can tell the external binding if it's like a new constructor, if it's like a class constructor, whatever, or if it's like a method function, you want to call this where you put in a value and then it calls uh, the function on this value like with a method, right? And uh, so we can interact with like the more complex features of JavaScript, but in the core language, we don't need that. And when we look at a Rescript file, so we have a Rescript file, which is .res, and you uh, compile it with the compiler, it will create an equivalent JavaScript file right next to it. And by default, when you define a value or a function inside a Rescript module, this value will automatically be exported or exposed as an export in this generated JavaScript file. And our recommendation is to write your functions and values just the way you're used to in, in Rescript. You can do for loops, you can do while loops, you can do like your typical array map and whatever. We, we have all the bindings there for all the 
JavaScript, uh, Web API, collections and arrays and whatever. And then you open a new tab with the JavaScript output and you can see that the, the compiled output looks very, very similar to the actual Rescript code, hmm. if done correctly. So this allows, and, and since this idea of a Rescript file is one JavaScript file, you can integrate it really, really easily in existing code bases. So if you decide on, okay, I just want to have one React component written in Rescript, we have like dedicated, first of all, we have GSX syntax integrated in the language. So there is like, this is a one-to-one -one equivalent thing. Uh, you can just use GSX in the language without Babel and whatever. The compiler will compile it into equivalent React.create element calls or in the new GSX API, what's out there now. And, and then you just have this, you know, one React component, put it, put it into JavaScript, like compile it to a JavaScript and then import it from other React components as if it would be a JavaScript component. And this partial integration is, is one of our most interesting features because people can first try it out and see if it fits their use cases. A lot of people are having, like, they, they cannot just rewrite the whole code base. Nobody can do that. And with us, it's like, okay, if you want to just try out one like one part of your application and maybe it's a very complicated part and you're like, maybe this brings us some value because we have like very complex interactions or maybe I'm building, I don't know, a code editor, a rich text editor, something with a lot of state and a lot of state transitions. Maybe let's try try this with one React component that is written in Rescript and then uh, let's see if it works. And if it doesn't work, if you do it correctly and you have always like the JavaScript file on the side to see the output, if you do it correctly, you can even like after some time when you decide this is not yours, you can just remove the Rescript files, check in the JavaScript source files, maybe rewrite it a little bit to make it a little bit uh, cleaner and you're done. You don't lose much on productivity there. And you're also not forced to, to rewrite it again in your specific other language you want to use or JavaScript. So yeah, this is just the insurance from our side that you're not locked into the system if you don't like it. What's up, party people? This episode is brought to you by our friends at Square. For our listeners out there building applications with Square, if you haven't yet, you need to check out their API Explorer. It's an interactive interface you can use to build, view, and send HTTP requests that call Square APIs. API Explorer lets you test your requests using actual sandbox or production resources inside your account, such as customers, orders, and catalog objects. You can use the API Explorer to quickly populate sandbox or production resources in your account. Then you can interact with those new resources inside the seller dashboard. For example, if you use API Explorer to create a customer in your production or sandbox environment, the customer is displayed in the production or sandbox seller dashboard. This tool is so powerful and will likely become your best friend when interacting with, testing, or playing with your applications inside Square. Check the show notes for links to the docs, the API Explorer, and the developer account signup page, or head to developer.squareup.com slash explore slash square to jump right in. Again, check for links in the show notes or head to developer.squareup.com slash explore slash square to play right now. So let's say I'm like Faros and I'm excited. I'm like, hey, Rescript, let's give this thing a shot. I know nothing about it. I write React-based web apps and I'm at least interested enough to hop in and see what it's all about. What do you tell folks? Where do they start? Where, what should they avoid, et cetera? Yeah, so the most important thing is we have everything on our website, rescriptlang.org. We hopefully structure the documentation in a way that it's easy to follow. We usually recommend to start out with the manual, which is more written in a narrative style. So you start at the introduction and you go through the installation and then you can dive through the most basic features. We didn't mention the more advanced features yet on the manual because we thought it would be easier for most users to just use the, the, the most basic stuff 
and you can build all kinds of React apps with that. And after you get some idea of the language, it is very, very important because a lot of people are coming from a JavaScript background. They want to interact with existing JavaScript libraries. And we've got a section there for interoperability for the external bindings I was talking about. So you need to get familiarized with how do I bind to an ES6 module? How do I bind to like a value to a function that is exported from a common JS module, maybe the default export, or how do I design, how do I map to a JavaScript class there? This is probably like the first thing you should definitely check out and at least try because a lot of people have this urge to jump into the ecosystem and like look for rescript bindings, like existing rescript bindings that bind to some JavaScript library. But this takes away a lot of learning possibilities. If you're in control of writing your own bindings to externals, it's much, much easier to, to do stuff, like generally speaking. And as soon as you got this, we also have got rescript react documentation section which covers actually the, the, all the basic concepts of React. We tried our best to, to also cover all the React topics because oftentimes we just refer, like some people refer users to the original resource. So go to reactjs.org, learn React, and then come back to our resource and learn Rescript React. We don't do that. So you can go from topic to topic there. How do I use GSX? How do I create elements? How do I... Uh, mix them up with existing components and how do I export it to JavaScript so I can use it in JavaScript. So from there on, it is usually recommended to just drop into your React code base, uh, run npm install rescript in your dev dependencies and set up a config file with mpx rescript in it and just point to the folder with your components and then create your first Rescript file, write your first component, try it out and wire it up in your existing JavaScript app. And that's it. Then you can, from there on, you can just play around with, with all the features and, and see if you like it. So it seems like kind of like Swift in that way, where, you know, when Apple was trying to encourage everybody to switch over to Swift, they had these large Objective-C code bases. And you could just sprinkle Swift in file by file or maybe even class by class. In this case, maybe component by component. You're like, well, I'm going to write this component in Rescript and it's going to generate this nice looking output. Do you check that into source code as well? Or That's a really good point. Yeah, we actually recommend checking in the JavaScript output files for the reason because, first of all, if you're like trying to bring new technology into your company, you need to convince your coworkers as well. And if they see, like, it's, it's, a, it's a matter of politics as well. So you check in the source code, they can review Rescript code in their pull request, and they can also see the equivalent JavaScript. And second of all, it's also very useful to, to spot regressions if you're doing some bindings and then you mess up a binding and then suddenly the output changes. You see that as well, which is super useful. But people will, will see the output and they're like, oh, I, I can understand that. This is not that scary. And uh, since Rescript is so fast, like the compilation itself, it will also not have a heavy toll on your CI workflows or um, on the consistency for your coworkers. If you check in the JavaScript source code, it's already in there, so they don't need to even run the, the Rescript compiler first. This has a lot of advantages, just bring in the technology and make your coworkers like you afterwards. <laughs> yeah. Now, what happens when they start editing the JavaScript output, not realizing what that .res file is? And they're just like, I changed this file, and then you just recompiled right on top of my changes. I guess that's the, the magic of version control, is you can always just go back in your Git history and dig that thing out. Yeah. And we also generate version headers, so it's usually a warning on top that this is uh, generated. But yeah, this is actually also a good generated. point. Like if, if you're like on vacation and then someone needs to do a hotfix because something happened, they, they can still, like even if they don't know Rescript, they can still hot fix the, the JavaScript source uh, until you're back and then you just fix the Rescript code. I think that's smart because honestly, something like this is like a very hard adoption because it's just so out there. It's new. We're going to talk about people using it and the, the association and the fact that it's not all that new, but you know, like nobody ever got fired for continuing to use React and JavaScript, but maybe for pulling Rescript in, if they didn't have these paths for A, incremental adoption, which is, you know, component by component or file by file, and then B, actually having both versions right there, 
and the ability for people who don't want to touch Rescript but have to hop in and you know fix a variable assignment or whatever the the bug is, I feel like it really does make it less risky. And at the end of the day, if your team is like, we're never going to use this Rescript thing. Stop writing Rescript. You have the JavaScript files right there. You just get rid of the Rescript files and. It's just some well-formatted JS that you just didn't write by hand. So I think that's a pretty cool thing for adoption. Right. And uh, I think one thing I didn't even mention yet, because a lot of people like to do like immutable JS or like this immutable data structure story. And uh, I kind of liked it in the beginning too, but then I realized that immutable data structures come with a cost. <laughs> and in Rescript, we have a concept of zero-cost interop which means that we take a concept and translate it to idiomatic JavaScript without any runtime overhead. And one of that is we have record types. We have record types that compile to plain JavaScript objects. So they look like JavaScript objects, but they behave like immutable data structures. So the optimizations for the immutable data structure so that it's immutable is done during the compilation process and not during runtime. Mm. And uh, this is also really great. We have... Uh, we also have like runtime specific data structures uh, built into the standard library. For instance, immutable lists are also sometimes very useful. Those are compiled to also JavaScript objects, but with, with a HT and a TL attribute. Very easy to check out on the playground, actually. If you try to use that, you will see straight away the output on the right side. But we also have immutable data structures if you need it. And some of them are zero cost and default. And this is also really great to explain to someone why this might be useful because you cannot run into this like weird issues where you try to use the object spread and you think you're immutable in JavaScript and then suddenly you do some change in an object and you mutate it and then you get side effects. And this is super annoying. I'm still trying to wrap my brain around zero cost immutable data structures. So in, in practice, if I was using Rescript, sorry, this is kind of a totally a random question, but it, I'm just thinking of like what I would actually experience as someone who's decided to introduce this into my, my project. Like when I want to use a dependency that I just you know found on NPM, like what's the process for most packages that I would find um, in an NPM search for bringing that into Rescript? Like is it a lot of work to write the bindings and all that stuff? And, and doesn't it have the same problem as TypeScript where the, de the definition files will get out of date or out of sync over time? I'm going to let Faraz ask all the questions from here on out. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I mean, this is exactly what we are, we are trying to figure out for the community as well. Like how, this is actually a philosophical problem. How do you make sure that all these NPM dependencies or these uh, Rescript bindings to these libraries are always up to date? My current approach, like my practical approach is you don't try to write these bindings like for the general community. Sounds a little bit weird. For instance, if I'm trying to write bindings for the, the full JavaScript web API, when you think about how complex this thing is, like the web API itself, it has like nodes and nodes are super polymorphic and they can have like a list of attributes and these attributes don't necessarily need to exist on certain values and in certain situations they do. And in a static type system like Rescript, which is also very, very simple, like the type system is not as clever or not trying to be as clever as TypeScript, where in TypeScript you can have like an integer on the, and an object and a, a string being in one type. This is not really possible in Rescript. You need to think a little bit more simply. So you cannot really bind to a JavaScript function that accepts a, a string or an object or a number or whatever. So you need to make decisions. So you can write a binding that binds to this function, but it only accepts one version of it. So it only accepts an object. And then you name this function, I don't know, parse state with object. You give it a name that tells the user that this is like the, the parameter. And then you have another one with, with integer or something. So there's a lot of opinions going into how do I write these bindings. And that's why I recommend to, to learn the external syntax and just, you, you define it like a variable, basically. It's like one line of code. You're like, oh, I want to map to, to the event DOM handler type or like one method of it. I just create one binding with this particular interface and then use it and later on you can extract them into modules and then just reuse them very very easily 
and so you can either share them you can even like i usually actually copy paste them around in 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 some projects if you're like really really cautious about that and you want to share it in your in your different code bases and you want to make sure that it's always up to sync you can of course extract it into an npm package but many of us actually don't have that many rescript code bases and it's actually easier if you have it in line and then you can edit it as you need and then later on publish it independently from that but this is more like this vendoring problem right so you can have like n dependencies on npm and those have another n dependencies and then you're like okay how do i fix this one bug which should be easy to fix but then i need to go to five different maintainers to fix that so my recommendation would be write them at Oakley, and if you got a collection of useful like bindings that have like practical proof then it's a it's a good point to start sharing them with the community because some people start it and then they they get overwhelmed with how complex it is and then they they stop it and then some people rely on that and that that is a problem so we try to educate the people to to really think about what they want to depend on and if they need to depend on it What up, party people? If you want to know what's happening with your code, track errors, and monitor your app's performance with Sentry, build better software faster with Sentry's application monitoring platform, diagnose, fix, and optimize the performance of your code, cut your time on error resolution from hours to minutes, it works with any language, and integrates with dozens of services. Over 1 million developers and 68,000 organizations already use Sentry. And best of all, GS Party listeners new to Sentry get the team plan for free for three months. Head to Sentry.io to get started and use the code PARTYTIME when you sign up. Again, Sentry.io and use the code PARTYTIME because, hey, it's party time, y'all. Patrick, if you were to meet some developers and interview them, and at the end of these interviews, you could pick one to be like, this is the person for, that Rescript is for. This is like our perfect user today. What is that person like? Are they senior level? Are they experimental? Are they building production apps? Are they in a large team, small team? Like, Kind of give us an idea of who should be adopting Rescript right now. So what we think our ideal developer is a product person someone who wants to build nice looking and performant products and uh, someone who is not too like pickery about like paradigms or like dogmas we we often have in in the community also in javascript or in java or wherever it's, it shouldn't be like a black white thing so people are not uh, saying oh i only want to do functional programming and i only want to do object oriented programming but they are more like I want to build this, I don't know, crypto wallet with these particular design and are excited about it and and get their stuff done in a timely manner as well. Good answer. So if you're that person out there, actually for Ross, you're kind of that person, aren't you? Like you're a product person. You like to build stuff fast and high quality and kind of in small teams. And you also work somewhat autonomously a lot. I think a lot of the difficulty is large teams like how do I introduce Rescript? That's why the incremental aspect is cool because it's hard to sell that to like your boss when it's going out on a limb for what for benefits, but how obvious and clear are those benefits? But you're in a kind of a position, and myself as well, where we can kind of make the calls on the technology choices and build pro- cool products quickly and, and with high precision and, and high reliability, it sounds like. Is that what are the big wins for somebody like for us? I know we've kind of touched on them, but if you could say like, well, I mean, zero bugs was yeah. <laughs> was nice. If it compiles, I mean, no tests. You don't have, don't worry about tests. You know, it's kind of like the TypeScript promise of as long as the types make sense, but there's no any type, so you actually have to have types. Uh, all of my TypeScript types are just any types because I'm just a dynamic kind of a guy. 
But what would Frost win? Like if he just picked up Rescript for his next startup or his next side project, what would he feel? What would he appreciate? I kind of feel like because I've seen a few projects already uh, that are out there, and I can also mention some companies later on. What I've seen that is that a, that there are quite a, a few startups using it. And for them, it's actually really, really good because I didn't even mention that too much, but as I said, like the type inference in Rescript is really good. So people can write their code without much fuss. They don't need to annotate every single thing. They can just write down the code, try things out. If they don't like it, delete the code again. But it's not like the compiler always complaining about certain things. So they can move really, really quickly. And later on, like when they start growing, they have legacy code, right? But they, they have a much, much easier time upgrading because the platform is not moving as fast as, for instance, the JavaScript platform. JavaScript can be really, really churning when you think about it. The community is smaller, but more focused. Uh, we have a very nice forum where you get nice support also by the core team members. It's very, very easy to, to upgrade code bases later on and, and stay up to date and you also can grow because there is always like as i said the compilation times scale linearly so you don't have to worry about later on like doing this journey work of okay i need to implement some caching i need to put this into a separate package so i can compile it independently and then the other one no you just put everything in a mono repo just compile it once and and put it on ci build it once everything works uh, just the way uh, it worked like with 10 files and now with thousand files, it doesn't matter anymore. So growing is, is much, much easier with that one. And yeah, this is probably my major observation. But also bigger companies profit from that because like feature teams, for instance, can choose the technology. And if they need to integrate an existing JavaScript code base, they can do it as well. So all use cases are kind of covered here. I was kind of joking about the whole testing thing, but is there a testing story or is there tooling around testing or do you, do you just say don't worry about unit tests because we got you covered yeah we of course testing is important we tend to test business logic mm -hmm. <laughs> so because that would sell me you know wouldn't that sell you for us it's like actually tests i know they're they have their value but with our tool with our language actually yeah just go ahead and forget about them you're not gonna need them you always have to worry about with a normal untyped like JavaScript app, which is like, do the two parts even connect together correctly? Like, yeah, did I rename the function in one place and I didn't rename it in another place? And there's no way to know until you run the app in, in production. So you need to have some kind of like integration test. And it sounds like with this, you wouldn't have th that problem. With any kind of sound type system, you would be able to just ditch those tests. Yeah. Yeah. Anytime you're asking like, did this other part of my program send the right thing I'm expecting, you know? It fixes that problem, but like you said, any typed language does that. What I would love to do is not write any tests. You know, wouldn't that be the ultimate productivity? Is like just write the code, and it's gonna work. <laughs> <laughs> that would be the, the the golden dream, right? Yeah. So I mean, that would get me on Rescript right away. I'd just be <laughs> I'd be done with every other language. I'd be like, all right, no tests, no bugs ever. Boom. Yeah. We definitely need testing and we usually, we're currently tinkering with a very, very, very simplistic recommendation for testing because right now you can use tape or you can use chest or whatever, but we are not too fond of it because it adds another layer of complexity again. So when you add chest, suddenly you have a lot of configuration again, you don't want to necessarily worry about. So what we are currently tinkering with is like a minimalistic test framework with air quotes here which is like a hundred lines of file like a hundred lines file of rescript code and you drop it in your project and then you can just use that test framework with with a standard set of you know like test functionality you usually expect and just run it with node just run a node script and you can run every test individually like with tape for instance I really like this idea of reducing complexity on the tooling side. And we, we try our best to, to always follow this philosophy. So hopefully the testing story will, will be as clean as the rest of the tool chain. Well, there's lots of stuff here. And it's worth pointing out, it's not Patrick just working on this, on your 
night and weekends. This is a long time effort by lots of people. As we mentioned at the top, like different projects kind of came together, different people came together and created a rescript out of these kind of other things that were all working together. The core team is seven folks, which is a pretty big core team. So there's lots of people working on it. Tell us about the community. I know there's also the rescript association, uh, which is kind of like a foundation or like a entity that is building this thing. So flesh out the community story, you know, so that people who are thinking about giving it a shot know what all is there. It's not uh, somebody's side project toy language that they wanted to, you know, learn how to do a compiler. And so they built a rescript and it's not like that. It's a serious business. Yeah. So uh, the original project started out in Bloomberg where Hongbo Tsang, the author of the compiler, started this whole effort I think this was five years ago already. So he started working on this until Facebook came out with ReasonML and uh, and got the idea. And uh, Cheng Lu got this really nice idea of making these two things work together, like the Reason project and the, the Bucket Script project back then. Facebook and Bloomberg kind of collaborated on this thing until it grew a few years and the community started to shape around it. We had... A few startups in there. We had a, a few bigger players in there. For instance, we had Sotheby's, which is a, a bidding platform for expensive artwork, which is located in Island, I think. And uh, we have companies like DraftBid, like a startup which has like an online editor for creating mobile apps, like a no-code tool with a lot of interactions and a lot of complex workflows. They are really, really happy with that. Of course, in Facebook, they have been using it in Facebook Messenger app, like on the web edition, web version, and which is also fully written in Rescript. One of our team, like uh, core team members, is Ricky Vedder, who is also working on the Messenger team. So we've got like the insights from that as well. We have companies like Ahrefs using it. They are a huge player in the SEO sector for analyzing SEO data. Uh, there is Ubisoft Club or Ubisoft Connect now, I think they rebranded. They they use parts of Rescript in their React Native app. And there's also some interesting companies like in Japan, Elm Inc. They built like an app which is called FastED. It's like a, a smartphone platform for the field triage of stroke patients. So when you think about like these medics or paramedics uh, currently in the, in the field and someone has a stroke and they have like a response app where they can ask for help and and ask for symptoms this was very important that the app doesn't crash and and for these use cases like where things should not crash no matter how how tricky it is like rescript is really good so these companies adopted it or ccaio which created an app for mission critical railway safety so when there is like a train passing down like in swiss or in france passing down a red uh, light they have like a huge form where they stop the train and then you need to fill out this form. And this is a very, very complex logic behind it. If you make a mistake, you can get in troubles because there is like a train standing on the tracks. And if another train goes by, then you have... You want that form to work is what you're saying. Yeah, 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 sure. <laughs> and companies like Tiny MCE, they are building um, like a rich text editor platform with Rescript. And for that is also like fantastic, like this, this really complex domains. This is where Rescript shines. And yeah, on the team, we, we've we got, as I said, Hongbo Seng, who is now also um, working for Facebook, Cristiano Calcagno, uh, who is like one of the cleverest scientists I know. Uh, he has been working on, on the Infer project, if you know that, for code analysis and static, static analysis of, of all kinds of languages. So he has like huge knowledge about analyzing code which is great for us because we have a lot of dead code elimination analysis going on right now for rescript because it's like fully typed it's super nice to an analyze uh, we've got cheng lu who has like a huge vision on on products and designs and lean clean interfaces i love that as well Maxim valke who is like our uh, master brain on the syntax level he has been investing so much time into writing a parser that is efficient and small like a syntax parser, super fantastic work. And yeah, and myself, of course, for <laughs> for working on the documentation. And I've been doing this like inside within the, the Rescript Association, as you already mentioned. 
The Rescript Association was founded with the goal to support the community and support like support the language with financial infrastructure so people can send donations to it uh, who are relying on the technology. So if you're a company who wants the language to succeed, the best way to invest money is to invest it in the association. They are allocating the money for uh, developing the documentation, growing the, the editor tooling, working on core essential libraries, funding other projects, organizing conferences. We had like two conferences already, ReasonConf 2018 and 19, and also a Reason conference in, in the US, which will most likely, of course, be rebranded to ReScriptConf. So in the past two and a half years, we, we also collaborated with research institutes and companies. Like we, we collaborated with Hrefs, which I already mentioned, with Tezos, with the Tezos cryptocurrency. They are also really invested in this because they want their crypto wallet apps to be stable. And they chose Rescript for their web frontends and, and stuff like that, or subsidiaries of Tezos, of course. Uh, Tezos is a huge project. So this is like how we try to set a foundation for the language on the community side, on the open source side. But also we have a strong commitment on the business side uh, with the core team who is working at Facebook and and all other <laughs> companies that depend on it. Mm-hmm. How about you personally? How are you paying the bills? I'm getting funded, of course, with the work at Rescript Association, but I'm also doing contracting right now. But I'm actually going to start uh, working together with another company who, who is using Rescript, which is Rohia. They're building a sales enabling platform, and I'm really, really excited about this. Building something something neat. <laughs> Building cool stuff is always fun. How did you come to the project? We didn't cover your personal journey to Rescript. What got you excited? What got you into it? I don't know. I, I started out in Flow, Flow type. Mm-hmm. Basically, I was like trying to contribute to to the Flow typed project, which is kind of the equivalent of definitely typed for Flow, and tried to get involved with with this work. And this excited me. And Flow was a really really nice project with the type inference and such, but TypeScript kind of won this this war, I would say, or the, the marketing. Mm-hmm. And and I kind of felt disappointed because I didn't like the idea of TypeScript at all, like the, the performance metrics and stuff like this. And in 2017, I got introduced to Reason and I got really hyped up with, with the idea of having this like polyglot platform of like having one language, but it compiles to different... St- things and and maybe you can have like alternative syntaxes mixing together but which was the initial pitch i i got in my head but later on i I got more involved in this and started meetup groups one in vienna and one in munich and i also organized the first reason conference in vienna 2018 and and this kind of grew on me and i was like okay um there is one thing that's missing terribly missing in the reason community that is a unified documentation platform because every every platform was like one separate website and was really hard to figure out where to find what information and and to find like a, a user flow, a user funnel. So I started this project with like naively. I was like, oh, I will just unify all the platforms into one website. And I did this for like one and a half years. And and, and at some point people started to like it because it was very useful. And then we we at the second time we we said, okay, maybe we should raise some fundings for that. And we started to think about this Rescript Association thing. And then I got to know all the people like Cristiano, who has been very supportive of our work. And he's like, he liked the ideas and he introduced us to the team. And ever since we started growing. And then in 2020, we really started like the new brand and and then said, okay, we have this core team and now I'm part of this. I mean, I'm not, I don't, I don't like this this idea of having a core team, but I think it's important to to have someone reliable for the technology you're using. And if nobody feels reliable, who, why should you use this? And that's why I'm excited that I'm on there. Pretty cool stuff, uh, Frost. Any other questions or thoughts from you before we call it a show? No, I'm I'm gonna try and find a nice simple project to give this a try on. Yeah, let me know how you like it. <laughs> Yeah, that makes me wonder, are there a good example apps or is there a version of like the M, uh, to-do MVC or what's that? There's a real world open source app that has a lot of like front end implementations. Is there anything like that where folks can 
just poke around and look at a not a complex rescript thing, but maybe like a semi complex one. Anything out there we can point folks to in the show notes? Also, is there anyone who's using it for specifically cryptography code? Um, I'm I'm just thinking the project that it might make the most sense for me to try it on is the little cryptography module that we just open sourced for Wormhole, and it it's not that many lines of code. It's like probably wouldn't take too long to port it to to a new language. That's the kind of code too that you that you really want correctness on, and it's worth you know yeah. extra cost for maybe making making it a little bit harder for a random contributor to contribute, but like you get m- more correctness guarantees. And yeah, I'm just curious. That's a that's a tough question. I cannot answer, but maybe I can follow up later with that. Mm, okay. Uh, but because I have some ideas in mind, but I'm still not sure if because some things are already existing, but they're still in reason syntax, and we don't want to particularly point people to reason resources, mm, right. which doesn't make any sense, even though it's the same compilation platform. The the best like real world example app is rescriptlang.org. It's an XJS app. You can mm. check it out. So the playground as well. Yeah, the playground is also written in Rescript. I'm not entirely proud of it, but it's pretty damn stable. So that's that's at least something. That's something to be proud of, uh, yeah. Yeah. And there are some open source apps. One is called Pupil First, but I'm still not sure if, if they're still on Reason Syntax or if they already converted because we have like this one like one command to convert your whole code base and that's it. Mm. Yeah. Well, why don't you do this? Uh, hit us up with links afterwards, and we'll put them in the show notes. Absolutely. If there are any ones that you would point to, that way you don't have to come up with them on the spot. And then, I mean, surely for us, the Tezos team is doing some aspect of that. I mean, I don't know what exactly they're using it for, but you know, they're cryptocurrency, but there also is uh, mm. cryptography involved. Yeah. yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah, that's what I was thinking. I was like, uh, it sounds like a great use for it. Yeah, totally. Yeah. Now, I would definitely be interested in seeing the results of that conversion for us. So if you ever end up doing it, you know, I think it'd make a good blog post or even just like, you know, tweeting out the links to like the before and the after of that module would be pretty cool. I'm sure. Mm-hmm. Are there any automatic tools to like get you started with like most of the way something that automatically port from JavaScript? No, there's there's nothing like that. But we have an an explicit section in the docs about converting a JavaScript file over in in a few steps because we can drop in raw JavaScript in a type safe manner it, or at least in a in a constrained manner. Uh, you should check that out. So you can take one expression or one function, drop it in as, as raw JavaScript. Right. Yeah, I did see that in your docs to embed raw JavaScript. You do per- percent percent raw and then everything inside the parentheses there is just raw JavaScript. So for us, there's your path to an easy port. So you just wrap your entire module in that and then you're done. You're in Rescript <laughs> land. Nice. <laughs> yeah. Well, listeners, all the links to all the things, even some things maybe not brought up, which Patrick has hooked us up with, will be in your show notes. So check those out. Definitely keep up with for Ross in case he does that port. I don't know what he just for Ross on Twitter. Maybe you'll tweet about it. And check out rescript-lang.org as well. I should mention that this episode was requested by a listener of the show, a longtime changelog member and a friend of ours, Brett Cannon, who also happens to be on the Python core team. So you have his interest. So there's smart people who are interested in learning more about Rescript. Hopefully this episode gave some people a start on a path down that way at a very interesting language and a toolkit and a view of making web apps that's awesome so patrick thanks for joining me for us thanks for hanging out we appreciate it and that's js party for today we'll talk to you next time thank you for listening to this episode of js party if you enjoy the show please do share it with a friend personal recommendations are the number one way people find new podcasts they love js party is produced by jared santo that's me with music by the mysterious breakmaster cylinder thanks again to our sponsors fastly launch darkly and of course linode next up on the pod Emma Boston is joined by Adam Sokoviak and special guest Yuna Kravitz to talk through some of the trickier CSS concepts. We'll have that episode all ready for your ear holes next week. Mm-hmm.